Okay, uh, thanks for the organizer for inviting me. Today I'm going to talk about essentially using algorithm structure for uh, uh, defining neural nets and also use neural net to learn some algorithms, okay? So uh, why uh, structure is so important? So five years ago when I'm looking into the convolution neural nets, I'm amazed by the ability of convolution layers. So in some sense, uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, original Alex net. You have these uh, uh, a layer structure, and actually more than 95% of the parameter is in the uh, fully connected layer. And then the convolution layer only takes about uh, uh, less than 5% of the parameter. But uh, this is actually the convolution layer is essential of the entire network to achieve that kind of human level, kind of classification accuracy. So uh, um, we, uh, at the beginning, we have done lots of uh, attempts trying to reduce the fully connected layer by some kernel method. We are able to do that and achieve the same performance of convolution neural nets with the help of convolution, okay? And later on, we try to replace the convolution uh, very hard by some kernel method. It's very hard to do that. So um, from my experience, uh, it seems that the power of these uh, convolution network, uh, neural nets, really comes from the structure, this kind of highly structured function class. So uh, then, uh, I am thinking that, uh, is there any other places where you have a lot of structure? You want to define your function class using those structures, okay? Such that you can achieve very good performances. So actually, um, uh, we know another uh, function class, which are uh, highly structured, which is convolution, uh, recurrent neural nets. So essentially, you can think about that you have some kind of a Markov kind of, uh, or hidden Markov model type of structure in your data, and then you can use recurrent neural nets. But actually, in reality, there are many other data types uh, which has a, uh, highly irregular uh, uh, structure, okay? For instance, uh, the network data everywhere. For in social network, you have each node as a person and per people are connected to each other. And you might have uh, uh, in each node additional feature, actually you have additional feature. You might have lots of prediction tasks about individual person in this network or about pair of person uh, where you want to do recommendation. So uh, such kind of problem occur in many, many other forms, including information sharing network, transportation network, even you want to study protein network, uh, you have these type of problems, okay? And then uh, it seems that the, the convolution neural nets and recurrent neural nets, it, uh, you cannot directly apply on these kind of cases. So one, one uh, particularly different uh, aspect of this type of data is each one is node in the network is going to have a different number of neighbors, okay? But in a recurrent neural net or convolution neural net, the input is more regular in some sense, okay? So uh, let me give you actually uh, a, a few examples, a three, three set of examples, more concrete examples and see how a uh, typical algorithm is designed for this type of uh, problems uh, uh, when we try to uh, perform some kind of learning. So the first set of problems is related to prediction for uh, structured data. For instance, uh, uh, one uh, kind of task may be uh, you have uh, some kind of information, a piece of news spreading in social network. Uh, given maybe the spreading pattern of the news in the first week, you want to predict whether this particular piece of news will get viral or not, okay? So in some sense, the input of uh, each piece of input data point is going to be a structure like this, a graph like this. So what you want to predict is the popularity of these particular posts after maybe one, uh, one month, okay? So you might also have some material science problems uh, where the input is going to be some molecule and then each one is known is going to be some actin and this actin is connected the wire chemical bonds into some structures. Based on the structure, you want to make a prediction whether this particular material is going to be effective or not before you actually synthesize it or do some kind of uh, chemical calculation. So you might have NLP problems, you want to uh, do the sentiment analysis of the sentence, you will use the past tree to describe the sentence and you want to make use of that. Even uh, when you're trying to do program analysis, uh, nowadays people try to represent the program as some kind of uh, graph structure, describing how different part of program related to each other. And uh, you might want to uh, classify whether the particular program is malicious or not based on the uh, actual contents of each one of these block and how these content are, are depend on each other, okay? So uh, this type of problem, of course, has been treated uh, before in the kernel literature. So uh, one simplest thing you can do is, uh, of course, you can hand design some features, some, some small structures. For instance, uh, uh, say I want to build a classifier uh, or a regressor uh, from this molecular structure to the actual property of this molecule. So one way I can do is I can define a lot of small structures. For instance, uh, this type of simple structure where in the middle there's a blue actin and it's connected to two uh, gray actin 
And then these structures are uh, uh, yellow actin in the middle, <laughs> and then you have a gray actin as the neighbor, and you might have uh, more and more complicated structures. You just count the number of such substructures in your, in your, in your data points, okay? And then that's your feature part. Feature, okay. It's like a bag of substructures, okay. So um, uh, if you actually go to a bigger data set and more complicated molecular structure, you'll find that you will need lots and lots of such substructures to be able to get a very good request or classifier. So sometimes you need to go to these uh, billions of uh, uh, substructures, okay. So it's um, that that means that the subsequently the model you get may be very high dimension. So of course you can do something smarter, uh, uh, especially using some kind of uh, algorithm for doing graph isomorphism check. Uh, uh, this is a, there's a kernel called the Weisfeller lemon kernel by uh, Karsten Bogwa. And um, essentially what you do is uh, uh, you will actually, uh, while you're enumerating these sub structures, you will compress it as you go, okay? So the actual algorithm will do something like this. And then you will actually first uh, look at a particular node, okay? So it has the original actin type. You're going to compress it. You're going to maybe make a dimensionality reduction or, or hash it. So you get some vector representation for each individual node. And then you're going to iterate and uh, they update this uh, vector representation until you converge to something or you just fi uh, finish in the final number of steps, T steps. So essentially, uh, you take these uh, in vector in each individual node and then uh, you propagate this uh, vector information uh, along the graph, okay? And then uh, uh, once uh, each individual node aggregate the information from neighbors, for instance, you can do very simple, just summation or concatenation, and you can recompress it again, okay? You do this t times uh, until in the end, every node uh, uh, has a vector representation. So, and then uh, in the end, you do some kind of uh, pooling, aggregation of all these vectors uh, in the entire graph and then use that to define your regress or classification, okay? So that will uh, compress your ve vector representation by a lot, and you will achieve about the same performance as that one billion parameter. But the, the, this deep learning approach I'm going to explain later on is able to do even more, okay? It's going to compress the representation by another thousand fold and achieve uh, about the same results, uh, sometimes <laughs> even better results. So the second scenario is this, okay? Um, and then you might have uh, recommendation systems and then people buy stuff in, in some kind of online shopping website. And then actually the data is not static. It's more dynamic in some sense. So, uh, so one person might purchase uh, shoes at some particular point in time. Later on, someone purchases something else. Uh, he himself might purchase the same stuff again. So the actual kind of data is recorded in the system in such a dynamic event uh, fashion, okay? So of course, uh, previous, when we were trying to handle this type of problem, one very commonly used approach is going to be matrix factorization. You, you look at this uh, uh, interaction network and treat it as some kind of matrix, adjacent sparse adjacency matrix. And you try to approximate this sparse adjacency matrix. So maybe the, these numbers here is, if this particular person uh, in each row, by particular uh, kind of product, you have one, otherwise zero. So you try to approximate that sparse rating matrix by the product of two lower end uh, matrices, U and V. And then um, once you have these particular U and V matrix, then you can make a prediction about those, uh, the, those blank entries, okay, and make a recommendation accordingly. So if you actually look at this algorithm, of course, uh, um, it's also actually uh, doing some propagation, okay? So uh, because uh, a typical, uh, one typical approach for solve this problem is uh, trying to actually uh, update or estimate this U vector, user vector, and then item vector V in an alternating fashion. So you try to essentially use the product of U and V to approximate individual entries. So it can be, this algorithm is going to be solving a sub-problem, lots of sub-problem like this. So this sub-problem is actually, uh, if you look at the actual algorithm, it's actually solved in a propagation fashion. So uh, the, the graph uh, on the top right-hand side uh, sort of uh, illustrates this process. So again, I try to learn some kind of vector for each one of these uh, uh, node, U and uh, the user node and vector uh, and product node. And then uh, when I'm trying to update this user node, so I will actually take those products that this user has ever interacted with and then uh, do some particular operation. In this case, actually, it's a linear operation if you solve this square, prob this square problem. And then uh, when I try to update these, uh, these uh, uh, item feature, so I'm going to take those users who has ever bought that particular item and do some kind of update, okay? 
So of course, uh, uh, it's a simple algorithm, and it doesn't take into account uh, maybe the temporal sequential information. It doesn't take into account maybe additional feature in the user, additional feature in the, in the item, okay? So it, in some sense, it's quite restricted, but they capture the essence of the, uh, the, 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 the sort of the one popular way of dealing with this type of data. So the, the later on, I, I'm going to explain this again, this, uh, uh, this new network structures defined according to this interaction graph, and it's able to uh, improve the, you know, the, the recommendation by, by a lot, okay? So uh, there's a third case, it's, it's closer to the uh, uh, computer science kind of setting. You try to solve a lot of a combinatorial optimization problem over a graph. So uh, you, might, you might be an advertiser, want to pick some particular uh, users in the social network to advertise about something, and but you want to pick it, pick this user smartly, such that uh, hopefully this uh, kind of uh, advertisement can spread to many other peoples, okay? So uh, this simplest version of the simplest version of this problem can be sort of uh, framed into a very clean and simple uh, minimum methods cover. So essentially this problem you try to do is, uh, you try to pick a small number of nodes as possible in this network, such that uh, each edge in this network, at least one end, is being selected, okay? Hopefully, if you uh, like that particular advertisement, your friend is going to see it, okay? And then as long as every edge has a, has a node which likes that particular advertisement, the entire network can see it. So uh, all of these problems are very simple, but um, um, uh, they are NP-hard, okay? And then people usually design some approximation algorithm or heuristic to solve this type of problem. A very simple heuristic algorithm is actually going to be also, in some sense, uh, propagating uh, things along the network. Okay? So uh, this is actually a two approximation algorithm for a minimum weather's cover. So what you do is uh, uh, you will actually score each individual edge. Okay? So you're going to look at this edge which has not been covered. Cover means that at least one end is being selected. So you look at this edge that hasn't been covered, and you're going to compute the total degree of the edge. You look at the, the degree of one end of this edge and look at the degree of the other end, sum them together, okay? In some sense, uh, these, uh, this scoring function is allow asking the neighbor to propagate some kind of uh, tag, okay? And then you count the number of tags from the, the neighbors. For instance, count the number of zeros from these neighbors. But this particular heuristic is going to be, is actually hand-designed, okay? It's very local and hand-designed. And then the question is whether you can uh, learn something better than these two approximation algorithms. Especially uh, in the industry case, this type of problem is solved again and again, uh, every day maybe, okay? And then the network structure is slightly different, but it may follow up just a distribution. In some sense, you have distribution of problem you want to solve, the question is, can you learn the algorithm uh, which does better than two approximation, okay? In this family of problems. So using Benning, again, you can learn something better than two approximation. So uh, uh, in some sense, uh, I've presented to you these three scenario, right? So it's uh, the input are all some kind of graph structures. And what you want to do is to design some algorithm which can either extract feature from this graph and then build some classifiers or regressors or uh, it, it's uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, combinatorial optimization problem over the graph. You want to actually design an algorithm to solve this type of combinatorial optimization. What you see is, uh, uh, in this algorithm, uh, you have some kind of hand-designed operators, and you keep applying the same operators. It's a composition of these type of uh, uh, operators, okay? So the question is uh, whether we can learn a better algorithm, okay, for these type of problems. And then can we use this type of iterative algorithm structure uh, to uh, define some structure for the deep learning models such that uh, okay, the, the deep learning model can perform better, okay? So uh, the, the framework I'm gonna present to you is uh, based on the uh, idea of actually uh, building uh, the problem or modeling the problem as a graphical model kind of setting. And then, and then use these inference algorithm graphical model to uh, define uh, or your deep learning architecture. Uh, use the graphical model inference algorithm as the template or structure for defining your uh, deep learning model, okay? Uh, afterwards, uh, these uh, kind of learned algorithms is going to produce some kind of vector representation for each one is node in the graph. 
and then you can use that vector representation to do either node level classification or edge level classification or uh, you can do entire subgraph level classification or uh, many other things. So y there are many other ways you can train it as well, including supervised learning generative model and reinforced learning. I'm going to show one example um, uh, for each category. Okay. So uh, why, why graphical model? So um, when, when, you, when we talk about structured data, actually uh, before uh, um, uh, maybe five years ago, uh, in computer vision, graphical model is actually uh, a very popular way of modeling structured data. So for instance, if you have a structure like that, maybe it's a molecule on the left-hand side, and each one is know it's going to be actin, right? So these X can be the atomic number or something like this, or additional feature of that particular actin. And the edge can be chemical bonds. So uh, if you think about it as some kind of uh, graphical model, then uh, you would design uh, some kind of click poten edge potentials or, or node potentials for this type of uh, data. So um, in this particular example, I'm going to think about there's a latent variable model uh, uh, behind this data, okay? So I'm going to associate each one is node in the original structure with the latent variable edge. The, the connectivity or the conditional independent structure between this edge is going to be the same as the original structure. Um, in order to specify the probability of seeing this collection of uh, variables, okay? So uh, then I have to define some kind of compatibility function, non-negative compatibility function between the occurrence of these variables. So for instance, edge is connected to particular x, I will need to have a potential and then an edge is going to uh, connect to its neighbors. I'm going to define some kind of potential for it, okay? Once, suppose you already have these kind of potential, the parameter already learned. So graphical model actually provide a very nice system, systematic way of uh, extracting feature, uh, performing inference about the particular node as it's situated in the network and, and aggregate all this information I even in distant part of the network. For instance, one very simple way to describe uh, the feature of a particular node in the network is going to, com you just compute the posterior uh, uh, distribution, okay? So uh, for instance, uh, uh, the previous slides have the joint distribution of all these hidden variables, right? So now I'm going to marginalize out the remaining variable uh, instead of HI. So, and then it gives me the posterior of uh, uh, PHI, okay? So that, posterior information in some sense is already taking into account the graph structure and also the other information in the network. So once you have this posterior distribution, then you can use it for many other things. For instance, you can compute some very simple statistics like mean and variance, all this kind of stuff, and then uh, use it for subsequent uh, prediction and, and then maybe some other more complicated task, okay? So uh, if we are able to do this density estimation and then the uh, inference efficiently, so uh, it turns out that uh, when the graph structure is complicated, if it is not a tree structure, then typically you can only perform this posterior computation approximately. So uh, there are some uh, proximate computation approach, uh, including this mean field approach for uh, performing these inference. Essentially, uh, you approximate the posterior distribution of this uh, collection of edge as some product distribution, uh, Q, okay? And then the Q is going to be computed in an iterative fashion. So you initialize this uh, posterior distribution Q, uh, approximate Q, uh, as some distribution. And you're going to iterate update this Q by sending messages, okay? So uh, uh, this uh, particular uh, algorithm in field is going to actually take these uh, neighboring Qs and, then, and, uh, and aggregate it in, in this uh, node. For instance, I want to update the posterior for H1. I'm going to take the neighbors of the H1 and have them sending the information. And then using that particular formula uh, here, the, the, the detail doesn't matter. But what matters is this particular update is going to take uh, all the neighbors of HI and then uh, aggregate it uh, according to the parameter in the graphical model. So of course, uh, in order to do this uh, inference, you ha would have to first estimate uh, these uh, potential functions, which is difficult by themselves. And then the uh, the the in some sense, the uh, update step also needs to do some kind of integration uh, if H is some continuous random variable. Uh, but the, uh, in total, you can think about this as uh, some kind of uh, nonlinear update operator, which takes the node information of HI and also some kind of information for a neighbor, okay? So instead of uh, uh, sticking to this graphical model way of thinking, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these kind of mean field templates and then directly parameterize these nonlinear update function. Okay, as some kind of nonlinear function, you can pick your favorite 
uh, nonlinear approximation method, but uh, for instance, you can pick new nets, okay? So then it will become uh, some kind of uh, uh, algorithm like this, okay? So what you're going to do is, uh, you're going to uh, say, uh, I'm going to represent the information each individual node as a vector mu, okay? And then uh, it's going to be update, updated iteratively, and this update operator, a uh, simplest form will be something like this. So it's going to take the uh, node information xi, and then you're going to take the neighboring uh, embedding information, and then do some kind of pooling, okay? And then do a transformation afterwards, you squeeze it through some kind of nonlinear transformation, the sigma, okay? And then uh, each one of these nodes is going to carry down the same update. Once you finish one sweep the update, you're going to carry down the second sweep of the update. Okay? And then the key thing is uh, this update operator is not going to fix beforehand or run separately. It's going to be parameterized. You're going to learn this parameter W1 and W2 together with some downstream task. For instance, if you want to do node level classification, you would take these uh, mu i's for individual node and then connect it to a classifier, or regressor. If you want to perform edge level classification, you will take these uh, mu i, mu j uh, for a pair of edge and connect it to some classifier. So you're going to use the downstream loss function to learn whatever parameter in these classifiers and also the parameter w and w2 together, okay? What exactly is mu? Mu is, uh, you can think about uh, some sufficient statistics of the posterior, okay? Yeah, but have a fixed form posterior, like you say, that's gonna be some so the, this already goes beyond that. I just say I want to learn the vector representation for each one is node. And the inspiration comes from the posterior, but uh, because you are not restricting it to uh, distribution anymore, so it's just some statistics, okay? So, uh, okay, so this is essentially the uh, uh, embedding of this mean field algorithm. So uh, you can see that it has uh, the same uh, templates, okay, as the mean field uh, propagation algorithm. You also have the same flavor of um, many other algorithms you see at the beginning, okay? So actually there are many names for this, this, this particular type of neural nets. It's uh, called graph convolution neural nets. It's called the graph neural nets, uh, many different names, okay? So uh, you can think about, uh, in, in this particular example, I'm defining a highly structured uh, neural net architecture, okay? The architecture is going to be uh, defined according to the graph structure and the propagation pattern is very similar to mean field propagation. So if you think about, and in the end, I use this uh, result of computation to define my function, okay, for prediction. So a graphical model in some sense is uh, uh, restricted to the actual graphical model parameterization and that particular uh, update, okay, based on the inference. But uh, this embedded algorithm is a little bit more flexible than that because you are not uh, 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 imposing, for instance, uh, distribution constraints or this uh, non-negativity constraint on, on your on your update, okay? But it's, um, it's, it's in some sense more restricted to, to a ge than generic fully connected ne network, okay? Or, or more, more restricted than the, uh, in some sense, recurrent neural nets, okay? So, so previous people have used fully connected neural nets or recurrent neural nets for uh, uh, structured data. But uh, th this uh, way of defining these neural nets according to the graph structure is more restricted, okay? But the edges that you have, like each edge has a different neural network parameter, there's no tying or anything. You can tie them together, depending on your application, right? Because in the graphical yeah. model, you would, you know, choose the form and then you'll have parameters that are sort of tied. Yeah, so the here you do exactly the same thing. You can use templates in some sense. Yeah. If it's Even in that case, this will be a bigger circle? I, it's a bigger than the, the graphical model, okay? Inference. You, you can make it uh, much more flexible than the graphical model inference. Okay, so, so the benefit of uh, uh, thinking in the graphical model way is uh, you can naturally get the family of uh, function uh, class, okay? Family of functions. So for instance, uh, um, uh, we know that there may be many other ways of approximating the posterior distribution, such as uh, belief propagation, right? Message passing belief propagation, and generalized mean field, generalized BP, and maybe many other, other high order corrections, okay? So you can essentially take all these uh, uh, graphical model uh, approximate inference algorithm as your template and then neuralize it, okay? So you keep the update in some sense template, okay? For instance, in this case, if you try to use belief propagation, then you will actually approximate each one is posterior as a bunch of messages along the, uh, the edges, okay? You will actually have a neural net uh, which uh, mimic that kind of operation, 
but the update is not in the density space, but in the uh, vector space instead. In some sense, you keep the flavor of the update, but you parameterize it as some kind of nonlinear function and learn the parameter in this nonlinear function end to end with later on uh, task. Okay. Um, so uh, let's just look at uh, some examples, how it works in practice. The first example I'm going to present exactly is this uh, structure prediction problem. The input is going to be some molecules, okay, materials. And the output is going to be uh, some continuous number between 0 and 12. It's the solar panel uh, uh, power conversion efficiency. So in this case, uh, what you want to do is you take the entire graph and you produce a single number. It's not predicting for an individual node. So uh, we will use exactly these uh, embedded algorithms, either mean field wash template or belief propagation template, and compute these embedding for individual node, and then you, you do pooling, and then in the end you have a regression function with addition prime by mu, but the, you learn this propagation operator and the regression function together. So uh, what you will get is uh, some uh, feature, uh, very small, and then uh, in some sense, uh, earlier I mentioned that uh, if you use this bag of feature, you will need to have one billion uh, dimensional feature space. So you can compress it using Hessian and this i 2 update of Hessian. As you compress this uh, method using the earlier algorithm, you will get essentially smaller model, but uh, your accuracy, mean absolute error is going to be uh, uh, getting worse and worse. But with this kind of uh, uh, embedded operator and learn the parameter of this uh, uh, embedded operator, you were able to get a very small feature dimension, but you get much better result. And the mean field version comparing to the BP version, the BP version is slightly better. Um, it seems to be consistent with the uh, graphical model inference that BP is a better way of you know, looking at long range information. Okay? So this is the sort of the game you will get uh, when you have this structured data set. So let's just quickly look at the second one and you will see that you actually need uh, this kind of belief propagation kind of template to do it. So in this particular case, the network is going to be dynamic, right? So what we want to learn is some kind of feature for individual user and individual items such that we can make a prediction whether in future this particular user is going to buy the particular product. And maybe you want to also ask uh, when, approximately when he is going to need it, okay? So one way you can actually apply this kind of uh, algorithm template from graphical model uh, to define new net is, uh, is first perform the transformation of this network. I, I call it unrolling. Unroll is a uh, time array network or, or temporal uh, or dynamic network. So uh, here is a very simple example. You have a two user and one item. So suppose, and then the axis is time. So maybe in the first time the user buy the particular item. So I'm going to actually copy the particular user node and item node. And then I'm going to build some kind of uh, cross connection between the user and the item just to indicate that user may affect the item, item may affect the user. And also these uh, vertical kind of connections to indicate that the user's interest may have evolved based on his past interest and item's sort of property, you know better. Uh, or I mean, uh, uh, item's property sort of also evolved from the previous uh, item property. So, and then uh, the next time maybe there's another interaction between the user and the item, then you add another a uh, pair of nodes and also have these cross and vertical connections. So then uh, next time maybe the user, the same user David, come back to buy the same item, you can also buy this. So you can see that the, this network structure has a little bit of flavor of uh, these uh, recurrent neural nets, but it also has lots of cross connections between the, the user and item. Essentially, uh, you can think about the graphical model associated, it's going to be something like this. And then what you want to do is you all want to do filtering. Okay, you also always want to condition on the past, predicting the posterior of uh, some uh, current or, or future variables. Okay, so then you can use this embedding to do it, and you are not taking information from all the neighbors in this graphical model. You only take information from the the historical past neighbors and propagate to the future. Okay, so then in this case you get some kind of embedding for. Each one is node at uh, any point in time, and then you can use the, the most up-to-date or latest embedding for, uh, in some sense, uh, defining whatever uh, prediction. Uh, okay, I, I will quickly just go through the, the final examples, uh, show you um, this, uh, this combinatorial optimization problem. So uh, in some sense, you have already seen uh, two examples, how you take in structure and then define new nets on top of these structures, and then learn some vector representation for the node, and use this vector representation to define prediction kind of uh, uh, models. So when, when it comes to solving combinatorial optimization problems, as you also have these structures input, 
And then uh, previously, uh, when you actually try to execute this approximation algorithm, people hand designed, is an execute according to fixed, you know, uh, function. So now you can actually represent that function, right? And then um, uh, as some kind of uh, a policy, okay? So for instance, this function previously to approximate algorithm, uh, this function is hand designed. Now you think about it as some a generic nonlinear function which takes the current graph as inputs. You want to give a score uh, telling you that how promising it is to uh, pick a particular node or edge in the network. Okay? You can parameterize this function by using this kind of uh, uh, mean field, embedded mean field or, or belief propagation over the network. Once you have uh, defined this, this kind of function, then you can use reinforcement learning to chain it using a family of uh, problem instances, okay? Instead of just uh, using one problem instance, okay? So uh, what is interesting is uh, uh, this approach of defining uh, this uh, embedded uh, inference algorithm and extracting feature, and use that to define this uh, policy for solving combinatorial optimization. You can learn some new algorithms, okay? Which does better than the traditional hand design algorithm. So this is a video, okay? The three graphs are the same, and I execute in three algorithms. One is uh, the learned algorithm. The other two are, two, uh, this one is a two approximation. This one just pick the node, okay? One at a time, based on the degree of the node. So you can see that initially, the, this uh, algorithm uh, is picking a node. Once you pick the node, you remove the corresponding node and, and the uh, incident edges. So uh, the, the best algorithm is going to clear up the graph the fastest, okay? So initially you see that the actually this uh, node greedy and edge greedy is doing pretty good, yeah? So it seems that it's going to clear the, the graph very fast and then no embedding is still very dense. But in the end you find the embedding actually catch up uh, and do better. It's because this node greedy and edge greedy is uh, some very old local operation. It doesn't take into account long-term benefit of selecting a particular node. So it tends to fragment this uh, graph into many small components. And in the end, uh, uh, the algorithm tend to, you know, uh, obtain many small components. You're forced to pick at least one node from each component. But the embedding approach is sort of picking a node to balance between, uh, um, you know, the degree and how uh, fragmented is the graph. So in the end, uh, even close to the end, you can actually still selecting uh, one node and remove many edges. So that's something that you learned f based on the distribution data instead of hand designed. Okay, that's pretty much of it. And um, in some sense, uh, so the, the key idea uh, of this approach is you take the structure data and, and, and think about that, that, that you are going to perform the graphical model inference on top of this structure data, hopefully capturing the uh, node information as it's situated in the network and maybe some additional uh, node information, edge information. And then you're going to parameterize these kind of inference algorithm using new nets. And then this new net is going to iterate along this graph structure. In some sense, you get a highly structured network structure. And once you uh, finish this iteration, you get some kind of vector representation of the node. And then you can use it for uh, uh, many different tasks, including prediction tasks and also solving learning some algorithm to solve combinatorial optimization problems. Um, this is uh, pretty much uh, what I want to say. OK? Yeah. Thank you. I guess so we any questions or comments? Or? Uh, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned graph functional networks, and usually they, they take an initial representation of each node and they refine it at each layer using the adjacency matrix. But what you do, like, you seem to uh, be like bear more importance about the fact of doing iterative uh, refinements of each node be, being, like, being given their labels. But maybe you cannot trust like your the structure of your graph right now. So for the like, missing edges. And so I feel like the, the approach that uh, com graph commercial networks like acting directly using the Laplacian or the edges in the matrix compared to your approach of uh, updating each node based on their labels. Like why, why is it so important for you to, to do this kind of uh, message passing? So, so uh, in some sense, if you look at the graph convolution unit, it uses graph Laplacian, right? Mm -hmm. um, Graph Laplacian actually it's about the same. It, it's uh, you will get a, almost the same operation as mean field. Okay, and it's the, the only difference is uh, uh, instead of doing pulling over the neighbors, you will have just different weighting for different neighbors, <coughs> according to maybe some predefined graph important structure. Okay, and then uh, what we find is not too many differences. Uh, the, the big difference is not big. 
there's almost no difference wh when you have a big data set. These learned weights can actually compensate for whatever weighting you, you assign uh, beforehand. <laughs> okay. So all these uh, graph convolution neural nets or graph neural nets and the mean field version of these, uh, the, these structure neural nets I'm talking about, they're essentially equivalent. Okay. And then uh, what's different is more like this uh, belief propagation version. Uh, somehow it's very hard to uh, think about from the graph Laplace point of view. Do you, uh, do you think that uh, the, uh, the, the means that we learn some kind of function, uh, so probably not the marginal, but uh, uh, have you tried to see if it's some interesting function that's shared across all the nodes? Function that's shared across, can, can so you So in the sense that, uh, so maybe it could be like the posterior mean, uh, yeah, so, so I try to interpret it that way. But uh, because uh, somehow uh, when I'm parameterizing this uh, nonlinear update, I'm not putting any restriction on a nonlinear function I use. And then um, it probably learns something beyond that, right? Yeah, and um, um, so in some sense it's more flexible than performing graphical model inference. But it has some, the same flavor constraining to the graph structure and propagating along the graph structure. So uh, it's possible that you take this vector and feed the graphical model afterwards, exponential family, for instance. Yeah, and then you might get some additional interpretation of what is the meaning of these features, but we, we haven't tried that, right? <laughs> okay. How many iterations do you typically have to run this particular data to the diameter of the graph or something like that? Yeah, that, that's right. So, so in practice, actually, you will run it for at most five or six iterations. So even, even for a social network like uh, with the billions of nodes and uh, maybe 200, uh, 20 billion uh, edges. So in some sense, uh, all this network that the diameter is, is not that high, right? very small. You get diminishing return as you iterate more. Okay? You, you don't see improvement, for instance, for the downstream uh, classification task. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so in most of the example, I didn't consider the missing value problem. I assume that the graph is okay, right? So maybe the learning process is also going to compensate a bit of the <laughs> missing edges. But the, uh, um, exactly how much uh, in fact, so I, there's a, I did a recent piece of work um, more on the direction of uh, the serial attack to this kind of graph neural nets, okay? Essentially, suppose you already learned a graph neural net. It's able to classify a particular node being a, a bad node or good node, right? So then I can take this neural net, try to attack it, right? I try to add an edge or remove some edge and see whether you're able to misclassify it. Actually, you, you can do it to some extent, right? Can you, um, in a naive consideration, uh, in the embedding process, you prove it, uh, you do not allow that missing value as you find it, you don't allow that. Yeah, I, at the moment I ignore. Right. Right. Oh, sorry. So now it's more like a hard constraint, right? Okay. So, so yeah. So, uh, uh, and, but uh, you can take into account maybe edge weights. You can code that into your update functions. Um, maybe you have some kind of probability over the presence of the edges. That can be one turn in your nonlinear update function. So in some sense, that's quite flexible, right? Yeah. Okay. So time to close this session. Let's thank all the speakers again.